The future of mining in Africa really has come across as a very strong theme at this year's Investing in African Mining in Darba. As we heard from the Mines Minister opening the, uh, the event today, we are in something of our winter of discontent in the uh, not only the South African mining sector, but globally as well as we go through one of those uh, troughs following the commodity super cycle. We uh, see mining companies shedding jobs, governments reviewing their resource uh, rent regimes, and, and the role players really considering the outcomes of things like COP21 which have just concluded in Paris. Now, one approach that is starting to gain traction is the development partner approach. And here to share more about this approach with us in this week's Africa feature is Peter Bryant, Senior Fellow and Henri Co-Founder of the Kellogg Innovation Network. Peter, a real pleasure to have you on the show. Michael, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, the Kellogg Innovation Network was founded way back in 2003. Just remind us what the network is really all about. Yeah, so the Kellogg Innovation Network, Michael, uh, is a global cross-sector community of business innovation leaders uh, spanning about 35 countries now. Uh, Businesses at our heart, uh, but we bring together uh, NGOs, government, politicians, military, uh, the arts, significant individuals. It's our belief that through this cross-pollination of ideas across different sectors that we can truly tackle some of the major issues uh, and to fulfill our mission which is to enable global prosperity, social, environmental um, and economic um, through innovation. So, And we convene in different ways and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic community, really is. So basically the biggest of the big picture thinkers are out there. When, That's what we like when, to when think, you look absolutely. At it that way. No, I mean it really is cutting edge um, innovation that, um, that, that happens at, at KIN as, yes. as the acronym is known. Now um, everything I mentioned in my introduction, I mean the case for evolving the mm. mining industry Industry, um, all of these factors seem to be at at their at their highest point. You know, the case has never really been stronger. Uh, we're we're in this trough. We've we've got mm. environmental social governance issues coming from COP21. We've got the social license to mine issue, and and it really is about taking an industry that is slightly. Um, long in the tooth and and saying, well, this is the way forward. How do we do that? Yeah. So, Michael, if you think back first why we did this, I looked at the development partner approach and it was really around the notion that the industry's social license to operate is diminishing at an ever faster rate. And we like to see that, you know, no country, no company, no project's immune to this. You know, we're seeing these issues from Canada to Australia to countries in Africa to Latin America. So it's clearly a big problem. And it's not just uh, you know, an issue for the mining industry, actually. Uh, and what we're seeing that's enabling this is we're seeing this transfer of power to local populations, to consumers, if you like, all being enabled by social media, which is essentially, as we say, gives everyone a voice everywhere. And social media is able to amplify that very rapidly, uh, but also allows uh, coalitions to coalesce cross-country boundaries around these problems. And it's putting enormous pressure on corporations. And that's translating into pro- increased project risk, delays, um, communities not wanting resource development projects despite the economic prosperity they may give. So it's a real challenge for the industry. So in good times, you know, the industry didn't really have to pay a lot of attention to that. They just kept on developing. Um, and the, the prizes were so high, the communities were accepting. That's That's has changed a lot over the last five years and it's really come home to roost now. So the development partner approach is really uh, seeking a a different way forward, uh, one that's much more collaborative um, and one, and I can talk a little bit about the three pillars if you wish. Uh, And just talk to me a little about the history of the partnership because there's a link through to Anglo-American through through a visionary CEO in in Mark Yusufani and a partnership with Oxfam. Absolutely, yeah. So this started three and a half years ago with Mark and I actually talking at the uh, at our Kin Global Summit, which is our annual get together, that we should take the catalyst approach that we had developed, which was about uh, taking changing an industry that has insurmountable problems through a process, an innovative process called the catalyst, to drive s- fundamental change in that industry. So the journey started just over three and a half years ago in Brazil, where we convened fifty leaders from different sectors, including Oxfam, uh, other NGOs, Indigenous. People. People. And a lot of those people had said they'd never been in the room together having a constructive conversation. So what Kin did was provide a tent that was both safe, trusted, and where we could have a respectful conversation. We actually worked for five days in Brazil. There was no PowerPoint presentations. And from that came the notion of changing the industry model to one of being a true development partner. 
And then for two and a half years, uh, a group including Oxfam, including indigenous people, including mining companies, uh, developed that development partner approach. I have to say, my fellow co-chair, Maku Dafani, chief executive Anglo-American, uh, was fundamentally key to this because for this to work, you need a visionary and a courageous leader who's willing to, if you like, actually step out from the rest of the industry. Sure and say things aren't working and we need to change. Where are they not working? Because I can almost hear mining executives uh, mm-hmm. perhaps uh, under their breath into their morning coffee saying, well, here we are contributing tax revenues, yep. uh, resource rents via var- mm. various royalty regimes. We, we're really, uh, a lot of us, good corporate citizens. We're not the mining companies of old. We, you know, mm. we don't go out there and, 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 and leave mines unrehabilitated. We close them. Where are we falling down? Yeah. I mean, undoubtedly the industry has improved a lot over the last 10, 15 years. There's no question about that. I mean, there's still a lot of problems. I think, you know, it gets down to that old hackneyed phrase of perception as reality. So in so much as the industry may think they're doing a good job, if communities, uh, if indigenous people, if NGOs, politicians, if society in general does not think you're doing a good job, then you're not. Uh, And it's, I think, up to the industry to lead and start having constructive conversations with people that are their critics to more deeply understand why and where are we failing. And an example of that would be, and actually Ray Offenheiser, the president of Oxfam America, came up with the idea, why aren't you speaking to the Catholic Church, for example? And there was one of those pregnant silences in the room, why would we speak to the Catholic (laughs) Church? And he said, well, they have a vested interest in mining in Latin America and Africa, where they are are often the most trusted person inside a community. So Mark and I, and I think this is going back two and a half years, we we travelled to the Vatican, met with Cardinal Peter Turkson, um, who's the president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, grew up up in Ghana, had never met anybody from mining, yet had a very strong interest in the outcomes of mining. From that, we agreed to have a conversation. We brought 25 of the leading CEOs to the mining industry for a day of reflection at the Vatican. Um, And that has created what we now call the faith-based dialogue, uh, which the kin catalyzed, and now the industry and the Church of England and the Vatican are uh, having ongoing engagement. So what it, what it did was create a common language between these two, had them more deeply understand each other, um, and now there's regional engagements happening in South Africa and Peru where the church is involved. So, so it's really kind of creating those bridges to people that the industry had not had conversations with previously. So... It's, it's, it's a, an absorbing example of, of how things had been done so often repeated in the past in one way and how overnight almost, if you start doing things slightly differently, one can see profound change. Now, yes. one sees that innovation kind of step change model through this. Is, is that the kind of model that you think will ultimately transform the industry? Because as I said earlier, you're talking about a, a, a mammoth industry globally, I think, mm. uh, contributes uh, upstream and downstream anywhere to you know, mm. 20, 25 percent of, of yeah. gross domestic product globally. Yeah. So it really is, it's a perception issue. It is a development yeah. industry. We need resources. There's going to be yeah. well over 7 billion of us come 2050. Yeah. So uh, we need to find each other halfway. Yeah we, yeah, we absolutely have to make this work, Michael. You're absolutely right. I mean, you look at the iPhone, 25 minerals in the iPhone. It wouldn't happen without mining. So we, we absolutely need to fix this. Um, it is about a transformative innovation effort. Um, and you know, change only happens, I always say, one company at a time. So it will just take one company to change that approach and, and, and show competitive advantage and increase value. But I have to say, you know, it's, um, it's all about the industry thinking differently, changing their minds, mindset and thinking more collaboratively with other people. So, but it's not just about the industry changing its mindset. I have to say other stakeholders as well. And it's about, you know, working in a trusted environment with mutual respect. I think there has to be more respect, more listening and understanding what everyone wants out of a mining project. So everybody mm. has different perspectives mm. that I don't think are being fully appreciated yet. Do you think those moments in time where we are in, in the sawtooth cycle, uh, as it were, of, yeah. of depressed commodity prices, is, is the right moment to seize, to focus all the role players around the table? Because it isn't much of that, uh, that typical agenda, that self-serving agenda, when, when times are as tough as they are. Yeah. No, I think the time is right. And I think people are starting to realise that this issue is actually the root cause of many of actually some of the financial issues the industry is having. Um, as well, one th- point I want to make, Michael, and uh, is that I think this problem is so vast, it's not the jurisdiction of just one organisation, one initiative to solve this problem. And I think there's a lot of wonderful things ICMM's been doing, World Economic Forum's thinking about 
And what we're trying to do is also collaborate with all of those organisations to try and you know, create a, cons a consistent message and a con collaborative effort ourselves uh, with the industry. You know, is the time right? I mean, there's never... I, th I think the biggest challenge for the industry, I always say the, the imperative for innovation, um, both for technology but also in this change, has never been greater, but it's at a time the industry has the least resources mm. and the least attention span to give to this. So this is kind of the, um, you know, almost the oxymoron of the situation. So, um, you know, it's tough. But I think if governments and communities seize the moment and leaders, I, th I think we can drive the change that's necessary. Well, Peter, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for on the feature tonight. But it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. That's what I love about the mining in Darba. One gets to meet uh, global leaders at the coalface, so to speak. Sorry to uh, use a, a resource <laughs> pun there. And, uh, and doing some fantastic work in trying to uh, take the industry forward uh, in, a, in a truly global way. Do take care. Great, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That was Peter Bryan, Senior Fellow and Henri Co-Founder of the Kellogg Innovation Network, really explaining some of the detailed thinking behind the development partner approach to transform mining globally in this week's Africa feature, reporting live from the Investing in Africa Mining in Daba. Established in 1995, Into SA assists foreign companies venturing with their brands and products into sub-Saharan Africa. Into SA provides assistance and services in all aspects of company setup, immigration, visa to any sub-Saharan African destination, facilitation of all tax registrations, business and sector licenses, as well as strategic guidance to comply with local empowerment legislation such as BE required mainly in South Africa or CE required in Zambia. For more information, visit them at intosa.com. That's into-sa.com. Into SA, safe and successful in Africa.